Okay, welcome to GathCast, episode 17. I am Dr. Sanders. And this is Robbie Gore. Hi, right, today we're going to be talking about definitely a lesser known goth band. And this is actually one of what I think is one of the most underrated bands, or at least has one of the most underrated albums, you know, that I can think of. Yeah, they're definitely, I would say, probably the least talked about band in the goth community that I really feel holds some real weight. And yeah. so that band is Rosetta Stone. Yeah, that's right. So obviously in today's world, not a very good band name. Yeah. Because anytime you search Rosetta Stone, it's going to be the, the language learning tool. But at the time, that didn't exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> at least as far as I know, I don't know when actually Rosetta Stone came out. But I'm pretty sure it didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so Rosetta Stone was formed in the mid 80s. Yep, it's very it, specific. Yeah. The mid mid eighties. It's hard to actually find information on exactly when it was formed, but their first release, at least as far as when they were releasing demos and everything, and touring consistently, it was nineteen eighty eight. Yep. So, and I'm gonna start nineteen eighty eight. Yeah, and their so. first debut album is nineteen ninety one. Yeah, and this is a band who had definitely a lot of demos, a lot of trying these songs out before they were recorded, and I actually think that. For songs that were actually spread out for a number of years, like, you know, for them being a band for a number of years before the first album came out, the first album actually has a very distinct, very cohesive sound. It does. In a way, they remind me a lot of the Sisters of Mercy and the Mission in the way that they kind of were around for a long time and demoing before they ever really released material. Mm -hmm. And even the arc of their career kind of mimics the Missions and the the mission gained popularity through touring and supporting the cult and Rosetta Stone gains popularity through touring and supporting the mission. Yeah. That's a pretty good way to actually compare it. One of the things that I think to actually distinguish this span a little bit is the singer. So the, basically the, what people, most people see as a mastermind behind the band Rosetta Stone is the singer, Pearl King. Yep. And as we go on and talk about each album, you'll see why, a lot of people feel that way. But let's just get on to the first album. It's 1991's An Eye for the Main Chance. Yeah, so this is their first major debut release. And I have to say, this is a really good album. I think this is a great album. In fact, I like a lot of songs on here a lot. <laughs> yeah, I will say this is one of few debut albums where I can honestly listen to the whole thing through and through and... I don't get bored. Now, I won't agree with that. Now, I'll tell you what songs I don't like. I'm not saying there's songs I don't like. Mm. I'm just saying that if this album comes on, I don't feel like super compelled to hit skip at any point. Yeah, okay. I think there's songs that are stronger than other ones, but as a cohesive album, as one unit, this is not an album where I feel like I constantly need to hit skip every other song. Yeah, and if just in case anybody's wondering, because I know some people are going to ask us, you know, how we listen to this or anything. This CD, this album is not extremely cheap. Yeah. And that is because I think what most people are familiar with is the release of the album Adrenaline. Yeah. So that's the U.S. exclusive compilation of singles and remixes that was released in 1992. Yeah. And I think that's what most people would think would be their first album. Like if you go into Spotify. That's what comes up. Yeah. That's yeah. what will come up as their oldest release. I think maybe like Foundation Stones or Epitome. They have there. chemical emissions, and but that's technically later. So yeah. yeah, and we're gonna talk about chemical emissions too. So one thing I really need to address with this band is that it is a band whose releases are a little bit confusing. Yeah, and that is mostly because they have a lot of compilations, and a lot of these compilations there, a lot. <laughs> contain different versions of songs that were on an eye for the main chance or tyranny of an action. Yeah, this is where they really start to remind me of uh, Sisters of Mercy, in that they only have so much actual material, but there seems to be like a lot. Of albums that are just released that are kind of remixed or remastered yeah, or it, and yeah it's it, it's a little confusing and that is one of the things like they really only have two to three releases yeah and for everything else like foundation stone the epitome p chemical emissions they're all just like remixes or demos of the songs that are already on those albums yep even the nothing ep is just from tyranny of an action so the things that we're going to talk about here are going to be the main albums. And of course, we're going to address some of the questions or some of the, you know, things that we think are worth talking about, like chemical emissions. But the first album officially is an eye for the main chance. Yeah. So not adrenaline. 
Yep. I just want to address that. And so... So, uh, for those of you who are trying to find this album, we actually had to go through great lengths to initially find it, but currently it's up on YouTube. No, so there's someone that isn't. No, it's there now. It is there? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's finally up on YouTube. Yeah, so it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now um, it is. You can actually find the album on YouTube. If you do want to shell out the money for a CD... Just a plain CD copy, you know, like not even factory sealed or anything like that is going to run you at least 20 bucks. Yeah. So and I would suggest the YouTube route for now. It just depends on if you want it in your collection or not. And for this one, honestly, this is going to be the only album which I would really recommend shouting out the money. If you can listen to it, yeah. just listen to the music. But if you want like the highest quality version of it, you know, if they ever added like Amazon music or something, I completely wholly recommend it. But I just wanted to tell you that they... This is probably the best album they did. Oh, it's a And it's the hardest album. album to find. Yep. So let's just get on with it. Oh, and dare you try to buy it on vinyl. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the vinyl copies of this album run steep. Yeah. They were, I think the cheapest I saw was like 150 or something. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, they sell for around 40 to 50 but they're pretty rare coming up. Yeah. A lot of times if you find it for even for 30 or 40 it's not even going to be the best condition. It's kind of unfortunate, but I think that a lot of people are actually seeking out this album because it is good. It mm. is. And although they never really achieved the same kind of mainstream success that, like, let's say the Sisters of Mercy or the Mission might have, Rosetta Stone really had a big following of, like, cult fans. Mm -hmm. And to the point where they actually gained a reputation, they actually have a name for themselves. They're known as the Quarriers. And yeah. so they are Rosetta Stone's most loyal followers who follow them around every show, anything they ever yeah. do, stock them. They haven't you know, really done much in last few years, but we just thought that yeah. it was important to mention. This is maybe a band that's kind of dropped off the radar for some people, but definitely did have a following. No, they did. And they were actually, well, Poor Old King himself was one of the first well-known goth musicians to actively contribute on online discussions in like board yeah. rooms and things like mm -hmm. that, chat rooms. Yeah. So, now that we've been sidetracked, let's talk about Night for the Main Chance. I don't know. It is cool to add in all information because I feel like a lot of people are coming in pretty blank on this band. Yeah, and I think that's a cool fact because a lot of these bands, you know, the only way for people to really connect with them was to buy their music or to get yeah. in the subculture. But poor King, like, really made an effort to reach out to his fans mm -hmm. and to be connected in the community online and, yeah. you know. I, I just think that's cool. All right. So as far as songs go on Eye for the Main Chance, they're pretty awesome, I think. And yeah, they're really good songs. One of the things I really like about this album, and we've talked about it extensively when we talk about other albums, and that is finding that perfect blend of kind of hooks and catchiness to actual aggression and keeping kind of that, you know, that grit to music. Yep. And we've had a lot of bands kind of fail with that. You know, even I felt like, the Sisters of Mercy on Floodland, to some extent, is almost a little too clean for me. You know, almost yeah. a little too produced when we were talking about that one. Um, not that it's a bad album. I just felt like, you know, definitely some of the kind of rawness was gone from it. But with An Eye for the Main Chance, it really hits that perfect point for me. No, it does. There's a nice balance between an actual live energy of the band and production value. And so what you end up with is this album that's really well written, really well performed, really well recorded. And at the end of the day, it's it's a fun album to put on. Yeah, I think so. The production definitely has a very dynamic quality. It like, does. Where like the instruments and stuff like the bass, the guitar and the drums, they really kind of burst out of your speakers yeah i've mentioned to donnie you know on numerous occasions that they remind me a lot of the mission mm -hmm. but i will say something that really makes them stand out to me from the mission is that i feel like they have a lot more dynamic range as a band i i would agree with that and maybe it's just because they have a lot of time to develop these songs yeah because if you listen to foundation stones and stuff there's already recordings of deeper and things like that on there but they all have really developed melodies Yep, and it's just catchy as hell. Some of these things, I mean, the song "Deeper," I just I love it. It's probably my favorite song on this album. And "Deeper" is a really good one. Like I that, actually like yeah. "Subterfuge" a lot. Oh, that's a good one too. Yeah, that's, like, that's my favorite. But I just like this that ba ba doo 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 doo
really really catchy guitar hooks on here there are and i will say one thing that i really appreciate about this album so those of you who have listened know that i you know have an undying love for the mission mm-hmm. but i actually you know i will you know i'm willing to put aside my biases and say that i think that this is a better album and show that they show stronger songwriting and performing skills on this album in particular and uh Gonzo medicine i think that honestly like this album shows more potential for a band than god's own medicine does like god's own medicine is so well put together but i don't see room for them to grow from Mm, that and and then when we look at their career they don't really that much i mean they kind of just stay at that static yeah point and rosetta stone i mean their next album honestly is probably going to be their next only real album i would say that but but they change a lot in that period of time Mm -hmm. and that just goes to show you how much they have to grow and how they can adapt and i think they're a really interesting band for that well i think this band in particular you know when we did um say like red lorry yellow lorry it seemed very hard to talk about that band without comparing it to other goth bands Mm -hmm. you know just because it seemed like an amalgamation of them yeah with Rosetta Stone, it's hard to really say it sounds like a blend of a few artists. Yeah, there's definitely elements of it, right? So with the mixing and stuff, you have generally very big, very reverby drums. You definitely have like that kind of almost like Egyptian sort of Satari sound from some of the instruments. Yeah. But that's about as far as I would compare it to some of these things because, yes, there are very, very stereotypical lyrics, right? Yeah. Like just talking about shadows and love and all the death and betrayal and everything like that, of course. But there's something about this that makes it feel really distinct. It it just really stands out. And one of the things I think really does that is Paul King's vocals, because he doesn't try to be like other artists. At least I don't hear it. And even though he may not have the best range, even though he may not, be like an operatic or anything like that yeah. there's so much energy in his voice and so much like ferocity in it that these songs work really really well for it i agree for me what stands out the most on this record is pearl king's voice and then actually the drums themselves because although you know they're mixed perhaps in a way that's very familiar mm-hmm. um the parts themselves are actually intricate if you listen to them yeah like if you compare this to let's say you know like god's own medicine which has very similar guitar parts per yeah. se god's own medicine very much sticks to like a four four kind of drum beat like just a oh yeah but this you know the opening track immediately we got drums that have syncopated rhythms Mm -hmm. and i really enjoyed a lot of that yeah one of the weaker parts i think of this album actually is the any part that is keyboards it almost feels like fillery yeah or just like used for the intros really or just kind of to add to it that's really the only complaint that i have as far as like musicianship goes for it because man they just have a really good sound on here it really feels like a live band there is such an energy to these songs and uh, i'm just gonna say the two songs that i really don't like and i almost just skip them every time i have to like burn another copy of the cd for my car or something like that i just literally take them out and so it's heart and soul and when the levy breaks the cover yeah when the levy breaks is definitely a weird one that's one track that i really do think should have been cut from the record i actually i totally do i mean it's just to me, it's honestly just kind of a boring song. It is. It's one of those songs where I feel like it didn't really accomplish anything by being a cover. And in that, I mean, it's not a direct cover of the song. And they don't follow the chord progression at all, really, mm-hmm. nor the melody. But the whole time you're listening to it, you're thinking about that song because the lyrics are so famous. And it's just really distracting. And they could have just taken those melodies and, you know, made a new song. That's kind of what I think. And, yeah, we're going to say this band is definitely prone to doing covers. But I actually don't think it's their strong point, which is kind of funny. Yeah. But as far as my favorites, it's actually pretty hard to pick some because it is actually so good. Leave Me For Dead. It was actually, I think it was actually, it had a single release for it, but amazing song. Deeper is probably my favorite off the album. And I, for the main chance amazing subterfuge subterfuge i never know how to say that 
subterfuge uh, subterfuge yeah yeah that i love subterfuge is my favorite it's song on this record yeah it's basically the ballad of the album it's a ballad but it has so much weight behind it it does and that's one thing i think this album does really well is even kind of saying it's like a ballad when you listen to it it's so distinctive from being a ballad and it's just so hard to explain but it's amazing and of course if only in sometimes i think it's a great closer for it later versions had adrenaline the single adrenaline added to it i think anything kind of added to this album kind of could diminish it you know because i think i think this group of songs fits really well together and not anything against the song adrenaline or anything like that but the original closer was if only and sometimes and i think it works really well yeah as far as other complaints one thing i'm going to complain about is the cover it's just kind of boring i will say it's not bad but it doesn't take any chances it's just a house it's just a gothic house yeah. with the words Purple. rosetta stone above it at yeah. least it's not as bad as the missions album covers yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true i mean yeah if it's in with the other kind of gothic albums but it doesn't really distinguish itself that much. In fact, I mean, the sound of this album is really what you come for. And I think it's seriously, and I'm going to say this wholeheartedly, I think this is one of the best albums that people don't know about for goth. I really, really think that because a lot of times, um, like say somebody wants me to make a mix CD for them, like, yeah. like, I'm like, oh, hey, you know, I'm really into goth or something like that. And they're like, oh, well, can you recommend some things? You know, maybe... You know, of course, everyone's heard Bauhaus and everybody's mm-hmm. heard the things. So anytime I make a CD of something that's like slightly more uncommon, I always put songs from this album on there. And they're like, oh, who is yep. this? And I'm just like, I'm like, it's from an after the main chance. And, you know, I maybe put something from Tyranny of an Action yeah. on there, too. But but most like 90 percent of them are going to come from an after the main chance. No, this really is a hidden gem. And I definitely agree with you as this album being, you know, probably one of the most underrated great gothic albums for me it almost kind of reminds me of how whenever people are talking about death rock you know like christian mm-hmm. death and bands like that always come yeah, up or maybe like 45 grade yeah, yeah that's like super one of the events by the way i want to address that like just because for an episode i've been doing like a lot of research on 45 grave yeah people seem so confused as to where that band lies yeah they, that i can't even describe it like they're a hard one to place it's like people put them in like horror punk and people put them in like like regular punk and people put them into they've been putting punkabilly before they yeah they put it and they put into like death rock and gothabilly i just had to like mention that because man like i have my ideas about what i think yeah that band is i'll save it for like when i do like a video about it but just doing the research it's so funny to see how many people like have an idea about that band and almost every single one is different yeah so, definitely but yeah but anyways as i was yeah. saying <laughs> those bands always immediately come up for death rock but the album that I always try and get people to listen to is, you know, Super Heroine's Cry for Help. Oh, yeah. Because I feel like that really is a forgotten album for Death Rock. Mm-hmm. And in a similar way, I feel like this is a forgotten album for Goth. I would agree with that. I think this band is, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of say my opinions for what I think. Yeah. Or at least what my opinion of is the band in modern days. But I definitely think that this album deserves to be listened to it definitely does and it, especially with the debut album because you can go back and listen to all the demo recordings and things on the, the releases like foundation stones which by the way has a pretty good live versions of some of the songs on here yeah but i mean these are just really well done i think this fits the perfect balance between having a raw energy like kind of like foundation stones does and then what we're gonna see later which is kind of an even cleaner version of some of these songs which i feel like kind of loses some of the energy so this really strikes a perfect balance for me. It's totally recommended by me, and give it a listen. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you on that. All right, so it's going to be a new segment for this episode. Yep. And we have a kind of weird news announcement. At least it's weird to think that this happened. And Yeah, and I'm sure you guys have are probably yeah. aware by now. So one of the reasons that I thought we would mention this one is also I've seen it posted endlessly on like got these subculture pages on facebook and a lot of people that we know are posting about it so i thought people would be interested in maybe our thoughts on it but it is the death of let me kill Meister from motorhead you know yep one of the most classic iconic images in rock and roll yeah one of the big figures of the second wave of british heavy metal yeah, yeah. so december 28th 2015 
His last day, he was around. So 70 years old. Not, yeah. not bad for somebody yeah, who it's drank not... Jack Daniels endlessly and did a whole bunch of meth. And who was supposed to die multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> A diabetes, a defibrillator, like, I mean... It's... And continued to drink and do drugs despite those things. Yeah. So, it's really sad, though. I will say I'm not shocked, necessarily. I really don't think anybody really was shocked, because Lemmy was very open about his health issues in the last yeah. few years. And I think he canceled shows. He... he did. Actually, he canceled a tour because he couldn't, like, get through, like, a mm-hmm. two-hour set. Yeah. And... I actually was fortunate that because I had never seen Lemmy up until about two years ago. Mm-hmm. Never seen him play live. And so I got to catch, you know, one of his last tours in which, you know, it was after he got his clean bill of health from his doctor, mm-hmm. after taking some time off from touring and, you know, coming back on his alcohol and his cigarettes. And I got to say, it was a great concert. And I'm mm-hmm. really glad that I got to see that now. Yeah. No kidding. It's probably honored. Yep. Lummy and Motorhead is an interesting band, and because I'm not sure we'll ever really have the opportunity to go in depth with them, just because while Motorhead does have a very long lasting career, yeah, um, they're kind of like ACDC, and then a lot of the music is very similar in a lot of ways, although they do definitely experiment at times and i actually do like a lot of the times when they do like i will say they are also like acdc though in the fact that although a lot of their music sounds the same people love it yeah every time they release a new album like the thing about it is they are one of those bands where you know what you're gonna get and the fan base wants that you know some bands where they kind of deliver the same album every time people just get like you know they get bad ratings from the fans because like yeah "Yeah, it's just it's like this album but worse but a lot of times people are just like, yeah, yeah. man, it's the next Motorhead album. And well, and when Lemmy, you know, wanted to branch outside of those things, he would take those projects outside of Motorhead. Mm-hmm. I think like he, he had, had Damned, he had, yeah, didn't he? Uh, I'm not sure about that one, to okay. be honest with you. But one of the things that I'm a huge fan of that he did was uh, Headcat, mm-hmm. which was his project uh, with Danny B. Harvey and then uh, the drummer from the Stray Cats. Mm-hmm. And they did a basically a rockabilly band it was kind of like a more of a like punkabilly kind of style mm-hmm. thing with Lemmy on vocals and they were freaking great. Yeah. <laughs> this guy loved what he did. Yep. And he seemed to be built for it. <laughs> yeah. And he always tried to make his fans feel like they got their money's worth. And definitely that's something a lot of musicians you could just say, you know, only do it for the money or do it for another reason. And yeah, Lemmy did it because it, provided him financial stability but it also i mean you could tell he was just like he was comfortable in his role yeah and i will say this you know he while he has no problem accepting money for the work he does Mm -hmm. he's not someone who's strongly motivated by you know making money i mean he lives or lived above the rainbow bar and grill in Uh this rent controlled apartment that he's lived in for years and it's this tiny studio apartment Mm -hmm. and he just doesn't care. You know, that's his home. He wants yeah. to live there. Yeah. And I respected that a lot about him. And I respected that he always, you know, made an effort to make sure his fans got the best that they could get. He canceled that tour because he absolutely had to. Like, mm-hmm. you know, those shows, you know, he couldn't do. And it would have been it would have been worse for him to continue and try and tour and just do it halfway. And so he made the decision, you know, call it off get a little healthier and then come back. And then when I saw him play, it was a great show. It mm-hmm. seemed like he had tons of energy. Uh, Slash made an appearance and played like mm-hmm. five songs with him. Yeah. It, and, you know, he was notorious for doing things like that. And Yeah. It's going to be missed. And uh, I know somebody who has a gigantic motorhead tattoo that was probably extremely sad. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I will say about his music, and I think it's not really dressed because a lot of people see motorhead as like a heavy metal band. Like, yeah. That's really what they are you know, it's like a metal band. That's what most people would think of Motorhead as. Though they're officially branded as part of the second wave of British heavy, yeah, heavy metal. Yeah, and I just wanted to say this because, like I said, I don't know when the next time we're going to bring up Motorhead. Is, yeah. Is, I love that Lemmy, in lots of interviews, would say, like, we're not a metal band. Yeah. He's like, we are rock and roll. Yep. He's like, I don't know where the metal thing came from, but we are not part of it. And... It's even when he was on that metal show, he's like, we're on that metal show right now. He's like, we're a rock and roll. He's like, and he even said like, we're a motorhead. Like the, the introduction to his concerts. Yep. I think it was something like, you know, we are motorhead. We play rock and roll. Yep. And I just think that that's 
so funny. Tuck, uh, that just reminded me of how like a lot of goth bands yeah. say like, you know, we're not we're really not goth, goth yeah. but a lot of people would associate them with it. But I mean, yeah, Motorhead definitely have a lot of elements of metal and they do have a lot of blues. They have a lot of like... They have a lot of punk too. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So let me, we'll miss you. Yeah. Um, hopefully and you're rocking wherever you are. Oh, I'm sure he is. I yeah. can just see him, you know, drinking whiskey somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I will say, if you don't know a lot about Lemmy and you want to know more, you know, after his passing, the last documentary that he did is a great oh, documentary. Yeah. Just called Lemmy. Yeah. Yep. That was great. It's great. I actually highly recommend that one too. Someone who made it on their own terms. <laughs> yeah. And I can really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Someone who has this very unique outlook on the music industry kind of sits not in it, but beside it. Yep. <laughs> so really recommend that. And then, one of the other news stories that we want to talk about, and this was kind of one where uh, this was, I think this news story was actually sent to us by one of our fans. Um, it was brought up to us, and it's kind of a weird one, but we know that a lot of people actually really like Monster High Dolls. Yeah. And, I mean, I know pretty, pretty much almost every single girl I know that's into God loves these things. Yep. And... Loves like, you know, like their funny little names and they have the specific ones that they like more than the other ones. Yeah. Um, I can't attest to the cartoons or anything like that, but the, definitely like the, the way the dolls look like they just, people yeah. just like collecting them. You know, they have a very unique, it's almost like, you know, the Bride of Frankenstein Barbie. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. Well, it just kind of reminds me like, I don't know, the, the culture that's surrounded around collecting these dolls almost kind of reminds me of, you know, like anime fans collecting, you know, like little figurines for, for like shows and stuff. I guess. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really know a lot about that, but, but yeah, I know people like these dolls. Right? Yeah. And so one of the things that they're known for is, like, yes, they are twig skinny and everything, but they don't necessarily look like, like the structure of them is not necessarily the same as like a Barbie or anything like yeah. that. And, they have very kind of like almost, I would say almost goth inspired kind of way that they look like very defined features, like yep. very kind of not necessarily like pointy, but very kind of unique features to their faces. Yeah. And they has been this petition to change, like to make sure that Mattel doesn't change it because Mattel wants to soften them up. Yeah. And, and make them look like more like, I don't know, like a regular like toy. Yeah, there's some images of what these dolls might look like. And they definitely look, uh, this is what they're going to be, definitely a little more tamed than yeah. previous Just say that their features dolls. are a lot more softer and rounder. What More what you think like a, yeah, like just like a regular like Bratz or something would be like. Yeah. So... A lot of people were like irate about this, and I was like, "Whoa!" I was just—I was surprised, but like thousands of people are signing this petition to keep Monster High doll spooky. Yeah, and I just think it's funny because I don't know—I mean, I don't—I don't know anything about collecting dolls or <laughs> her toys or anything like that. But I don't know if they change like Barbie a lot, and people get mad. They—they they do change Barbie a lot. Uh, I don't know if. They, people get mad about that, but they uh, do change Barbie a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I definitely saw some people who are like, of course, the one thing that we like is it's getting changed. Like, you know, the one thing that's on the, the aisle for us. Yeah. You know? Um, so, yeah, I guess there's a petition. Apparently, Mattel is, I don't know, they kind of buried the announcement at this point. Yeah. At least when we're recording this. So, um, yeah, look into it if you're interested, but buy up all the Monster High dolls and you can have the... You can have the super rare old style monster high dolls if they switch. Yeah, and then like, <laughs> I don't even know what to say, but yeah, I can just say. <laughs> could have the ones that look like, um, I don't know, before they get pulled from the shelf, just like if there's you one. You can have morning. the goth dolls. Yeah, you can have the goth ones. So, so yeah. And um, the other thing is, it was, uh, as we're recording this, it was David Bowie's birthday the other day. Yeah. He's 69. Yep. And he just released another music video. So, I just want to say. Happy birthday, David Bowie. Happy birthday, indeed. We love you. I love you so much, David Bowie. Please come on, Gothcast. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> but look, I'm actually, he just released a new video for um, his new album, and it's, it's pretty good, too. Yeah. So. I, I'm usually rarely disappointed by Mr. Right. Bowie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm one of the few people who likes 
Earthling. So yeah, I definitely am never really disappointed with David Bowie at all. Okay, so that's going to be our news segment for this week. It's the death of Lemmy. Unfortunately, the irate reactions of changes in Monster High dolls form the only mainstream outlets that kind of cage spookiness and happy birthday David Bowie yeah 69 years old so that's it okay and so before we talk about tyranny of an action which in and of itself has a lot to talk about yeah I did want to give a little bit more information about the release of the album Adrenaline now basically what Adrenaline is if a lot of people want to know just because it probably comes up in their discography a lot it's a compilation of single releases and then, you know, like some of the tracks from An Eye for the Main Chance. And the main ones that you're going to want to listen to, at least that are new, I mean, obviously Adrenaline is a really awesome song. Yeah. And we start to see kind of a little bit more of the industrial sound in that single. Yeah. And then the other one, which I think is not a classic, classic classic song that a lot of people don't know about is the witch yeah the witch is really good and so i love the sound of that it has like the violin intro Mm -hmm. but we definitely are starting to see where they're starting to go and it does include leaving for dead night for the main chance dark side pretty much every single single that they had released so going with adrenaline is not a bad idea it's not because that's the one you're going to run across probably a lot more yeah but with an eye for the main chance you're going to get some songs i think are awesome like <laughs> I think that honestly, you know, in Eye for the Main Chance is probably, you know, the better album to buy, but I don't think you you're gonna go wrong by buying no. adrenaline. No. And I if don't. you come across it, you know, for good deal, I'd pick it up. Yeah, I totally agree. I just think it's important to mention that it adds the witch and adrenaline, and that's two really awesome songs by yeah. in fact Probably if you look them up, that's probably going to be the two songs that you're going to find are most associated with them. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, they weren't even really on a, a main album. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, let's talk about the next album, which is going to be The Tyranny of Inaction. Yeah, so Tyranny of Inaction is released in 1995 and then is revised later that year with normalization. Yeah, so one of the things, if you actually I haven't heard the original one, is that, my God, you know the what's called the loudness wars and yeah for you for people who don't know <laughs> loudness wars is basically this thing in the 90s where everybody's trying to get their album to be kind of like that sonic loud speaker bursting radio friendly masterpiece right yeah ever since nirvana yeah came out <laughs> so what people would do is they record these songs and then compress them every single instrument until it was basically insanely loud and yep. by loud it means like literally that if you looked at it like on a scope, it would pretty much be you know, just a decibel giant, meter. Yeah. <laughs> it basically just max out. Yep. And so the tyranny of an action, it almost like distorts. So yep. your ears get very tired listening to the original one. But most of the time, at least online and everything, you're going to find the revised edition, which is really nice because yeah. a lot of times when you're running across the CDs, it's actually going to be the one that doesn't have normalization, mm-hmm. at least from my phone. Cause I've run across it twice yep. and both the times it was the one where it wasn't revised. Yeah. So go it, online for that. <laughs> yep. I definitely think, uh, you're probably going to enjoy the normalized version better. Yes. I very much agree. <laughs> well, let's just kind of get into it. And there's definitely some differences in this album. Yeah. So there's a lot to talk about with the tyranny of an action. There's a lot of change here. There's consequences of that change. Some of them good. Some of them not so good. Yeah. But nonetheless, I still think that this is, you know, it, it's a follow-up album that's worth talking about. There's some good material here, but I think it definitely has a uh, footnote here of the sound. <laughs> it kind of. All right. So basically, after, you know, they finish releasing Adrenaline, they end up buying a... Uh, Alesis ADAT multi-track recorder, and they start really experimenting with uh, sampling and kind of like industrial sounds. And you should note that you know uh, at the same time, uh, Nine Inch Nails is kind of coming on the scene too. Yeah, and not only coming on the scene, but is definitely stirring up the kind of yeah darker sound. You know, most people are starting to associate, say, classic goth movements with kind of the new industrial movement or 
you know, I mean, around this time, Nine Inch Nails was, was pretty much championing what was most people who were into the darker side of life for, you know, what they were going to do. And he was selling millions of albums. Yep. And I will say that that is kind of really where things switched for goth. And, you know, a lot of people talk about how industrial music and goth are very different things. But it's also important to know how influenced each genre was by each other and how they're almost inseparable at this point. If you go to any goth club, you're going to hear industrial music and you go to an industrial club, you're going to hear goth music. That's, that's very versa. true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we even went to one where it was, I think it was just like supposed to be like all traditional goth music. And we heard a, had like a hole, you know, like a dance, like an, a dance version of had like a hole. Yep. So, I mean, especially with some of these bands, and I think especially bands like Ministry, bands like Nine Inch Nails, um, like even Skinny Puppy. I mean, a lot of people have a lot of love for those bands, especially in the early years where yeah. their sound was so dark and definitely didn't have that kind of glossy appeal that, mm-hmm. you know. Well, I mean, I guess Ministries with Sympathy is a little fancy, but yeah, that's a whole different discussion. To me, it seems like a natural evolution for goth and industrial to become involved with one another because you have all this experimentation in goth music with electronic things like synths and drum machines. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's not that far of a stretch that they would pick up things from industrial music and start using them as well. You know, like, Yeah. Basically, the whole reason we're saying this is because this album seems heavily influenced by the industrial music team that was happening and resembles a lot of what nine inch nails was doing yeah a lot of these songs remind me of uh had like a whole yeah <laughs> <laughs> but tear of an action for better or worse definitely is much more industrial and from what i can tell a lot of fans were pretty angry about this change you know a lot of them a lot of people came to rosetta stone because of releases like an eye for the main chance or adrenaline and yeah I honestly can't blame them because you're going to have that kind of flashback whenever you change your sound. And in this case, I feel like it's actually a pretty dramatic change. I mean, one album to the next, basically I'll put it this way. These songs could never be on the same album as an eye for the main chance. No, I completely agree. And I definitely see why, you know, people might've been upset about the release of this album and the change in direction. But I'll be honest with you. I don't think that like a lot of the material on this album is bad i think it's very different and i think that people who are fans of theirs are probably going to want to hear the first album more than they're going to want to hear this album but i think that there's some good material here and i think that they tried some things that were worth trying i will give you that i think that there is definitely some material that is worth listening here i think that there are some songs in here that are almost unlistenable and i know like that may be saying a lot, but man, some of this stuff drove me crazy. I don't know. Like I, to me, you know, it's not their strongest album, but to me, nothing on here was unlistenable. And we have listened to some albums that I will definitely call unlistenable. I don't know about <laughs> that, but uh, maybe from time to time. But <laughs> I just think like, uh, okay. The one thing that I, I do like about this one is that even though they, I mean, basically got rid of the real drum sound. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much just, a very, very loud, very mechanical sort of drum sound that you have here. Yeah, I will say that is a complaint for me on this album because I really enjoyed the drum sound of the last album. Yeah. And I enjoyed that there was implementation of industrial kind of drums and like electronic beats and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I would have liked to have seen that incorporate alongside actual drums. Yeah, I would have have too. That's not to say that these songs are just worse off because that because a lot of material is written around the fact that they don't have a real drummer yeah and i do like that they kept a lot of the guitar sound in here yeah they definitely did but just the direction of it is what i don't like so they have still have a lot of catchy things and i'll say the songs that are my favorite this is pretty much the songs i like out of this album they are going to be the song Nothing, the opener. Yeah, Nothing's a really good one. The Good's Gone, which I think is the best song on this album. Barna, that's my favorite. Absolutely. Like, there's nothing I like more than that song because I felt like it had way more of a sound similar to their earlier work than what some of the stuff on here. Yeah, it's definitely more reminiscent of their past work. Yeah. Um, I will say one song that really did bother me was Side Effect. Okay, there's basically two different versions of it. Like, yeah. they're, they're common. Like, so... 
the side effects on here and then there's like a remix that is on most copies of the cd yeah the remix i cannot stand i hate the remix the original i think it's okay like the idea of the song is pretty cool like some of the melodies stuff but man this is a problem for the whole album but especially this song and a few other ones is that they're so repetitive the, that was my problem with side effect is it by it's, it's seven minutes long seven minutes and 45 sec, 46 yeah. seconds to be yeah. precise and by like minute five i was just like okay wh- when is the song gonna end well actually there's the other one of the versions like that long but then there's another version that's like six minutes like i said that gets hard with this band because they get yeah there's like multiple versions of each song on most releases yeah the five minutes and 58 yeah five so, minutes 58 yeah because yeah, the the one i hate the, that's the remix version is the one seven minutes long i can't stand that one yeah i can't stand but, that either but the, even the original one which is almost six minutes long it's just repetitive i mean you are it's just that that phrase you are my side effect you are my coming down i don't even know how many times it's said it could be, it'd be a drinking <laughs> it's game. Just way too much it's just insane the song friends and executioners it's okay i liked it it wasn't as good as nothing but i thought it was a decent song and so at that point at the album i was like okay you know like let's mm-hmm. see where this goes yeah and side effect came on and i was like i please don't play this song again yeah <laughs> unfortunately i can't really say I'm, i like much else on sound pretty much the first four songs i think are good i think the song one angel short of heaven is totally just a nine inch nail song i actually like him. that song uh, i don't i stop i'm not a fan of it like i just uh, and then pretty much everything else on here like never rise rain spoiler interference like I just found myself wanting to like this material more. But if I'm honest with myself, I didn't really like this album that much. I mean, even the song Nothing, I think, you know, it's probably one of my favorite songs of the album. I still don't think it's a super good song. I think The Good's Gone are is like my favorite song on this album. And I think it's probably the only song that I would put in like the category that's the quality is as high as their other material before this. I don't know. The way I look at this album is the goods gone is the song that I would group with the rest of their material, but I don't really have a problem with a lot of the songs on this album. I didn't really mind the direction change. I thought it was an underdeveloped album and I thought that, you know, perhaps they could have gone on to explore this genre more and these influences and Mm -hmm. perhaps put out an album that would have been like a really good blend between what is the Rosetta Stone sound and their, you know, industrial influences. But I still thought that this was a decent attempt at an album. I think it's an okay then. Like I really was just not crazy about this one. Like I had a feeling we might have differing opinions on this one, but yeah, but man, like I just, uh, it was just really frustrating because I had this on, um, like most of the albums that we do, I listen to it a lot before yeah. we talk about it just because you want to have a really fresh opinion of it, even if you've heard it a million times. Yep. I just found myself so bored throughout most of this and I just was struggling. Like I really liked the first four songs, but that was just compared to the rest of the album. Like this is definitely not on my top 10 industrial albums or top 20 or I don't know. I just—it's definitely not on my top ten, but I don't think it's—I it's, don't think it's on my worst ten either. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a pretty bad industrial music out there. Well, I mean, it's been pretty bad God's music out there too. But yeah, but I don't know. I just—I just didn't like this one. I—I was, I was to be honest. Like, I just—I don't recommend this one that much. I recommend listening to the Good's Gone, and that's pretty much all I recommend for me because. <laughs> I don't know. I disagree slightly. You know, I recommend people at least check this album out because I think that there are some people who will find things on this album and like it, particularly people who are just not familiar with Rosetta Stone, you know, Mm -hmm. in general. If you're like a diehard fan of Rosetta Stone, you're probably not going to like this album. Yeah. It's just the change from kind of having a more, I hate this word, but more organic sound Mm -hmm. and basically a sound that sounds like a few people in a band jamming together you know yeah as opposed to a more developed kind of machine like studio driven album yeah and that's what i feel this one is it's, it takes a huge jump from feeling like oh, a bunch of people jamming together to computers so yeah yeah well that's uh do you have an action yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so now we're on to chemical emissions now, this is a weird one. Now, yeah. Like we said, there's going to be some pretty confusing things with this band, and we're trying to keep it as straightforward as we possibly can, but 
Chemical Emissions is basically a re-recorded and remixed version of An Eye for the Main Chance. Yeah. And they go as far as renaming songs. Yeah. So, like, Subterfuge is on here, but it's called I Can't Forgive. Yeah. An Eye for the Main Chance is the opener. It's called Am I Wrong? Yeah. <laughs> and they even have a remix of Nothing. It's Actually, called... most of the songs are renamed. <laughs> yeah. Everything's renamed, pretty much. Yeah. And um, Nothing. So, Nothing's Remixed. From as from Tyranny of an Action yep. to Sacred to Me. Now, as far as the sound on this album, I think it. <laughs> I, I don't want to be super mean. Like I hate I hate being really mean to albums. You know, I really do. I think we're just honest. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want, <laughs> but I swear that this album is basically like an artist taking it and going like, "Let's ruin something really good." I I, I kind of wholeheartedly agree with you on this <laughs> because what's done on this album is basically taking a lot of these songs that the reason that they were really good is because they had a feeling to them they had a yep. kind of specific energy to them and what this does is basically like i mean i don't know what he was thinking when he was recording them but from my perspective it kind of looks like he was like oh well these songs sound dated and yeah they could be done so much better and line up with modern radio you know or something mm-hmm. like that and so it did is took it and just kind of removed the kind of like rawness to it and made it so like, okay, so like everything sounds like it's done by a drum machine. Yeah. The vocals are pushed much, much, much higher in the mix Yeah, to be more catchy. And then the guitar and everything is just more downplayed. It's just more boring. Yeah. yeah. This album doesn't really bring much to the listener except for the new hidden bonus track plastic toy it's okay yeah like, it's not even that great of a song yeah so <laughs> i thought that this album was important to mention because you know we were mentioning that a lot of the songs were recorded for eps or like foundation stones is but this is also one of the albums that's easier to find like oh, this definitely. is on spotify this is this is know. definitely it's probably one of the most common albums you're gonna run across with them in yep. fact pretty much everything after adrenaline is is pretty common honestly but finding something like Foundation Stones or An Eye for the Main Chance is probably the hardest thing to find, like, actual physical copies of. Yep. But I think once Adrenaline, they kind of started gearing things towards specific markets. And a lot of them are a lot easier to find. Like, Adrenaline's even easier to find in the UK. Yeah. And this stuff became very readily distributed. Yeah. I will say it's a bummer because I don't own, you know, the physical copies of these CDs. And it's hard to find, you know, the credits for these albums besides their debut album. And I know on their debut album, Poor Young, their guitar player, was the producer for that album. Yeah, it's Poor Young. I thought it was was Poor King. No, that's their singer. They have two Poorls. (laughs) My God. So many (laughs) Poorls. Yes, they they have two Poorls. But Poor Young... Their guitar player, uh-huh. not the singer Pearl yeah. King, yeah. <laughs> is the producer on the first album. But then for the later albums, I couldn't find any, you know, liner notes or, or credits for, you know, who was responsible for what. And I was curious to see if they had a different producer, if maybe Pearl King produced later albums, or if they had an outside producer, and maybe that affected the sound. Yeah, and- I think especially with. What we're going to see later, I know that he was responsible for like the last release that they did, almost yeah. wholly, at least as far as I've read. It's one of these bands that does have quite a big following in some places, <laughs> but yeah, it is kind of hard to find specific information on some things, but actually there's an unofficial website, it's like a fan site, Yeah, it actually is a great resource for yep. this band. Like, it's a little, I'm going to say, it's a little dated, <laughs> the website's a little dated, but... I still think it's really good. It's uh, it's the best out there for this. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's definitely the place to get information if you want to find out as much as you can about the band Rosetta Stone. Yep. I'll put it that way. But yeah, I just uh, Chemical Emissions, as, as far as now, you just want to see different versions of good songs from the other releases that are done what I think is worse <laughs> than Feel Free. But as a standalone album... Or as a starting point for his band, I really don't recommend it. Yeah, I I don't either. I kind of feel like this album is just a lazy album, to be honest with you. Yep. And I feel bad saying that because I don't want to, you know, yeah, like I said, crap on a yeah, band. I don't like. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want anybody to say that about me, but yeah, as if I'm being honest, like as far as like you know, my opinion is, I don't think it's very good. 
It just doesn't need to exist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do agree. Yeah. So that's chemical emissions. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about what is, I guess, technically would be their last official release. Now, like I said, this... Technically. Yeah, technically. <laughs> so, like we said at the beginning, Resistone is a band where I almost feel like the discography is, is very confusing and intimidating to a lot of people. And that's really because they essentially only have about two albums worth of material over the course of their history. Yeah. So, Knife for the Main Chance... The singles from Adrenaline, you know, like The Witch and Adrenaline, and yeah. then The Tyranny of an Action, and pretty much everything else after that is repeated. So Chemical Emissions is all songs from the first two albums and, like, one new one. And Unerotica is covers. Yeah. And they're done in an even heavier industrial style. Yeah. To the and point of where the vocals aren't even important. <laughs> What I'll say bothers me about this cover album the most is not that it went further into industrial music. It's just that none of these songs are better than the original songs, in which case, why do I want to buy this album? I would agree with that. Well, there's a few reasons why that is. <laughs> and that is one, a lot of the catchy melodies and everything like that aren't adjusted enough to feel unique. No, they're not. They're pretty much straightforward covers just done in an industrial style. Yeah. And the vocals, they're super low in the mix for yeah. a lot of the songs. So it, it just doesn't really sound that good. The songs on here are songs that are very, very reliant on yeah. not only the instrumentals, but the vocals. I mean, a lot of songs are pop songs, yep. which rely on vocals. So listening to the melodies of the instruments repeated again and again and again isn't necessarily the most entertaining thing so whenever you have the vocals that aren't mixed very well or aren't as pronounced mm -hmm. it's just a boring album yeah i will say i feel like this album required more effort than chemical emissions did yet this is almost worse an album it's really hard to say it, it is it's it hard is. to say because <laughs> it's too they're bad for their own reasons yeah like chemical emissions <laughs> They took their own they're, songs. They're both lazy in different ways. Well, Chemical Missions, they took their own songs and made them slightly worse. worse. And then with this one, they're taking other songs and making, making them, them slightly worse. Well, so making them slightly boring. And that's worse. They're worse. Okay. <laughs> so, but you have like Road to Nowhere by Talking Heads. You have Shout by Tears for Fears, which I think that th that cover is really bad on here. Synchronicity 2 by The Police. You have The Spirit of Radio by Rush. Which I know you in particular really I, don't like that I cover. I hate that cover so much. You hate, you hate that cover, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's just a really, really weird album. I I guess I read a little bit into it, and I guess one of the reasons it exists is because they were still under contract. Yep. So to, they got to put out an yeah, album to deliver an album, and so honestly, can't really blame it if that's one of the reasons or it, the main reason that it came into existence. Then. You know, who am I to say it deserves to be released or not? If it was just something to get people off the back. But it just is kind of a bummer that like, a band that started off with so much, like, <laughs> promise, right? You know, I can forgive some experimentation, right? The tyranny of an action. Yeah. While I don't necessarily like it, I can commend that they were taking it in a new direction. They while... still did something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, man, just, like, talk about a band that starts strong and ends weak. Yeah, imagine if we decided to take our first episode, 50 episodes from now, and just re-record it and talk about the same things over again but in a slightly different fashion. But it's way higher quality. <laughs> it has a lot more bumpers. <laughs> I think you guys might be kind of upset with us. <laughs> yeah. So, on Erotica, I think as I was saying, it's not recommended. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or if we took someone else's podcast and covered it. <laughs> Make, I think we'd be the first person to ever do that. <laughs> there's a there's a DVD. I forget what DVD it is. Like some DVD set where the people do commentaries on the commentary. So there was like, and then and then when you listen to it, they're just like, "What are you doing?" And he's just like, "We're doing commentary on the commentary." And he's just like, "It's like it hasn't been done." He's like, "You know, it probably hasn't been done because this isn't a good idea." You know? <laughs> like that's kind of kind of what it reminds me of. At least the idea of yeah. re recording up doing cover of a podcast. <laughs> It's getting weird because this is like a weird, this is kind of a weird, these are weird albums. I mean, what can I say? Yeah. But the last album I oh, really wanted to, to talk about on yeah. here. And I, I want to kind of end up on, on a little bit better of a note. So there is an unofficial release. And I think as far as I can tell, it did become an official release later. 
It is called Under the Rose. It, it did become an official release in 1997. Yeah. So it was initially released as a cassette, kind of like a bootleg fan cassette yep. of a live performance. From 1991. Yeah. And so this is obviously not for the main chance tour. Yeah. So it's in the prime of their band. Yeah. And so it's a live album. And yep. Under the Rose, I think, is actually a really good live album. I'm going to say the quality of the album, because it is basically coming from a remastered cassette, not the best. Um, yeah. But it definitely makes up for it in terms of energy, you know? It does. But at the same time, I, to be honest with you, I'd rather listen to an eye for the main chance. Well, yeah. And one of the reasons for that is that they just sound really similar. And yeah. They, and that is so funny because most people would complain that, like, you know, they sound so different from the album, you know? Yep. <laughs> but th- these versions of them... Sound so similar to the, <laughs> the yeah. actual recording that... Uh... And that's actually a credit to An Eye for the Main Chance of the album because it does show that they really captured that live energy. I wouldn't be surprised if they recorded it live. I wouldn't be surprised either. But some of them, like, the compositions, the guitar is a little thinner just because... You know, it's a live album. Yeah, it's a live album, and the vocals are pushed a little bit further. So, if you kind of that depends on who their sound guy was that night. Yeah, yeah. So, if you want to hear almost like an eye for the main chance, the album a little bit stripped down and a little bit almost, I don't want to say like demo-y. It it yeah. kind of has that feel. It does. It? What I really would have liked is if they found video from this concert and synced up the audio to it and released it as a DVD. I think that would have been a great oh, idea. Man. Yeah, that's actually one of the things I wanted to address in kind of our closing. But oh, that's pretty much all there is to say yeah. about, um, <laughs> about that album. But I, I recommend it. It's actually pretty easy to find. So um, go look for it. But yeah. in kind of closing about Rosetta Stone, something I want to say is that, yes, I do really recommend some of their material. Like their earlier material I think is really good. Do I recommend all the remix EPs? Do I recommend all stuff? No, not really. Yeah. In fact, the, no. the two things I'm going to recommend wholeheartedly from me are going to be Not For The Main Chance, and if you want a little bit more of that kind of sound, listen to the Adrenaline release. And you can even do the Adrenaline Deluxe release, which kind of has it like remixed and some of like the more, you know, like the Witch's longer version. Yeah. But can I recommend a lot of pretty much anything else from them? Not really. If you want to hear some of the songs again, like you can listen to Foundation Stones, Two, you know, Foundation Stones has a lot of the songs that are on Eye for the Main Chance and some yeah. live versions of like Deeper and I think Subterfuge. But uh, Rosetta Stone is kind of a sour thing once you get into the later stuff because I feel like this one of those bands who, if they kind of stuck with the sound that they had started with, kind of would be more popular today. And Probably. That's, that's something that I think... Or if they had spent time developing their new sound, because it seems like as soon as they had their new sound, they went immediately into just remixing old songs and doing covers. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a really big bummer. Yeah. And on Erotica, I just, I don't listen to album for fun. I don't either. I mean, I have been listening to An Eye for the Main Chance for a long time before we talked about this band, you know? Like, yeah, we've is... pretty much been listening to this album since we started, yeah. the, like... Yeah, and it was one of those things where I was like, hey, you know, this is band, it's awesome, like, yeah. you should listen to them, and you're like, man, this album's great, and yep. then it's just like, it's really disappointing, you know, they did do a cover of Actually Closer by Nine Inch Nails, and I still think that cover isn't even that good either, but... I'd rather just listen to Closer. Yeah, <laughs> so it's really a sad thing for me to talk about this band in depth, because it's just a band that starts off so good and has such an amazing start like the music that they come out with is great it's classic it has a totally unique sound paul king's voice is very unique yeah and has so much energy and then it just goes into something so average and something that is boring and i and like i say i said i think i say this pretty much every single episode we do an album that's boring but the worst crime for me is to do an album that's boring and unfortunately that's what their albums become later like you know? yeah yeah I think the theory of inaction is has some interesting stuff on there, but yeah, some of it. I still recommend that album to people. I I don't think it's as good as an eye for the main chance, but I still recommend that people check it out. Yeah, you can recommend that. <laughs> but then on erotica and chemical missions, they don't really need to exist. No, not at all. And that's just kind of a bummer. So if you want my opinion, that's that's it. So Rosetta Stone, I think has 
a highly, highly underrated music. Like I seriously think some of the songs are some of the most amazing songs that like came out of the nineties for goth. Yep. At least in terms of having a sort of blend of eighties to early nineties sound. Yeah. But yeah, then it just goes to stuff I can't recommend. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's the truth. So it's it's a bittersweet ending for this band. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of stuff that, that we want to convey to our audience and, you know, really urge them to check out this band. But at the same time, it comes with a footnote that don't expect this to be, you know, a prolific career from a mm-hmm. band. Yeah. And this is unfortunately one of those cases. Yep. As far as finding <laughs> Rosetta Stone's videos and stuff, yeah. it's super rare. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so you can find a few videos, a few live performances, but this isn't going to be one of those things where you keep uncovering more and more and more and you're just like, oh, this is amazing. This part's amazing. Like, it's kind of like every time a new video of like typo negative comes out, like I'm like, oh man, this yep. is amazing. Like from this year and then one from this year and one from this year and one from this year, you know? Like, there's very few things about Rosetta Stone out there. And I hope that changes. You know, I if, if people release videos of them performing live or, you know. Or if maybe they release some videos yeah, of them performing that, live. <laughs> yeah, or better quality versions of some of their videos. Because they do have music videos. A lot of people have probably only seen The Witch one. But yep. there are other videos for this band. Um, you just have to go search them out. Maybe if Poor Old King started joining back into the online community. Yeah. <laughs> That, uh, just in case anybody's wondering about the continued history of this band, Pearl King does continue to work on music. At least I, th- I think he does. He definitely had a lot of projects after this. So if we feel like any of that is worth covering, um, or if anybody's interested in it, I guess, then we'll give you an update on it. But I just really want to take this episode to talk about a band and an album that I really recommend that a lot of people hadn't heard. Yeah. And so those other bands that are... Uh are associated with them are dream disciples and then misery lab if anybody wants to look them up yeah so dream disciples and misery lab but this has been gothcast episode 17 i'm dr sanders i'm robbie gore and of course oh wait something new this episode yeah so something happened this week we made a business decision we are now part of the belfry network yeah I don't know. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, you know, Daniel Ford, who runs the Belfry Network, he's a really nice guy. He contacted us and asked us if we'd be interested mm-hmm. in, you know, being hosted on his, his network and being promoted by him. And we talked to him a little bit about it. And the more we talked to him, the more interested we were in it. And overall, it just seems like a really good network for, you know, gothic podcasts. Yeah. And we're happy to be part of the community. And it's nice to see that there even are gothic podcast networks. So it's just cool to find kind of like-minded people. And they actually have some really good podcasts on there. Of course, The Count hosts... Cemetery Confessions. Yeah, and, and they have Gothropology, Horror Addicts. Dark Light, Requiem. And also they host YouTube shows, which is actually really nice. Yeah, and so if you go to their webpage and you click on links, you can see the YouTube channels that they're associated with. Some pretty good channels. Yep, <laughs> and he even sponsors art. You know, he hosts some blogs. It's um very nice. We're happy to be part of it. And just... Look forward to creating content, hopefully with them in the future. I mean, you know, we haven't had anything planned out just because we're pretty busy with the cast most of the time. Yeah. But if anything comes across, like we're on one of their podcasts or we try to do like some sort of video with them, that would be really awesome. But just being part of their network is something that we are very happy to be included in. <laughs> yeah. You know, just wanted to let you guys know that uh, we joined the Belfry Network and, uh, you guys should check it out. Uh, for those of you who don't know about them, their website is www.thebelfry.rip. It's B- R-I-P. It's B-E-L-F-R-Y. Yeah. Just so you know. But if you want to get in contact with us, let's plug our usual social media. Yep. So we got Facebook. It's called Gothcast. We got Instagram. Gothcast. Gothcast. Got a YouTube channel. Gothcast Video. There's a space in there mm-hmm. for unknown reasons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got a website, which would be awesome if you guys checked out, called yeah. gothcastradio.com, no www. And uh, we got a Gmail account, gothcastradio at gmail.com. It's mm-hmm. pretty much it. Yeah. So if you have any questions or you want to check out any of that, just feel free to. 
But this has been Gothcast, and we are signing off. Yep. Stay spooky.